As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 196, Stalin, Lenin's Protégé. Last time, Stalin was officially sent south to Tsaritsyn to gather the local grain and send it back to Lenin, so he could feed Moscow, the Bolsheviks' current home, and Petrograd. Yet what he was really doing there was gathering power unto himself and removing all those who were, or wanted to be, his peer. During this time, Stalin had stolen 10 million rubles from a man sent down by his fellow Bolsheviks to assist, and the man's trains. Stalin had also had people killed, not for sadistic pleasure, but to whip the locals into a frenzy. He wanted them feeling, not thinking, a tactic that would become common for him. But Stalin had gone too far. Joining with the local self-described Cheka, they, for personal gain only, had terrorized the area. And these men were supposed to be the ones protecting the people. But now, General Pyotr Krasnov, the elected leader of the Don Cossacks of the White Army, opposed to the Bolshevik Reds, had heard enough. His army soon surrounded Tsaritsyn. It was Zverlov who wrote to Stalin, telling him of the assassination attempt against Lenin in the Milkinson factory in Moscow in late August of 1918. Telegrams flew back and forth between the two men. As Stalin and Trotsky were out of Moscow, Zverlov was in charge. But Zverlov knew of Stalin's hate for Trotsky and the latter's lack of respect and, quite frankly, disgust for the former and the temporary leader, Zverlov, writing to Stalin, knew his own personality was not big enough to handle the tension between the two men. Basically, an intra-party civil war of some kind was building between the two men, and the only one who could stop it was the now seriously wounded Lenin. All the Bolsheviks needed the older man to pull through, as did Stalin and Trotsky, for their own sakes. And Lenin would pull through, but he might have wished he had not. Before too long, the tension between Stalin and Trotsky erupted in a campaign of letters, and they were all sent to Lenin, who was still recuperating. At the end of September, Major General Saitin was sent to Tsaritsyn. But right away, Stalin and his Cheka henchmen sought to disrupt Saitin's work and communications with Moscow. Then Stalin wrote to Lenin, insisting that Saitin be replaced by the more pliable Voroshilov. But Zverlov replied, and one can't imagine him doing this without the consent of Lenin, all decisions of the Revolutionary Military Council of the Republic, i.e. Trotsky, are binding on the Revolutionary Military Councils on the front. So Stalin just switched his argument and still attacked Saitin to Lenin. Zverlov advised diplomacy to his friend in the South, but Stalin only knew haste and survival. Trotsky heard of all this through Saitin and wrote to Lenin, I categorically insist on Stalin's recall. Finally, the entire question was being put before the now stronger Lenin. Trotsky argued that the Red Army outnumbered the Whites three to one on the Southern Front. Why is Tsaritsyn being threatened by the Whites or being harassed by General Krasnov? Furthermore, he threatened, if his orders were not carried out, he would reprimand Voroshilov and Minin, the local Czech leader, to a court-martial and publish this fact in an order to the army. He wrote to Lenin, no more time for diplomacy. Stalin's argument was much less detailed and coherent. As such, He lost the case. Lenin ordered that Stalin was to be recalled. However, he was not to be punished, as Trotsky had wanted. Stalin arrived in Moscow on October 8th. Back in Tsaritsyn, the local Cheka would remember Stalin and remember 
that he was their kind of guy, someone who could get results and line their pockets at the same time. Back in Moscow, Stalin was relieved of his post in the southern sector. That was for Trotsky. However, he was placed on the Central Military Council of the Republic. This was for Stalin's future, as Lenin recognized this man, or this type of man, would be needed, always. But now that he was a member of the Military Council, his immediate supervisor was Trotsky. The mess to the south still had to be cleaned up, but Trotsky was too busy, and Lenin too valuable. So Zverdlov was sent down, with Stalin in tow. Zverdlov and Stalin reached Zaritsyn on October 11th. On October 15th, the Cossacks of General Krasnov were right behind them. So Zverdlov found himself having to prepare the city's defenses and find out what had gone wrong. Moscow was expecting a report. Accusations flew all over the place, and in such an environment, Stalin figured out pretty quickly that there would be enough confusion to cover his deeds. So he departed the area on October 19th. But then the Whites and the Reds were battling out, which did not matter to Stalin. He was saving himself. This meant that Trotsky had to rush south and help with the city's now tested defenses. But before things could get worse, for the Reds, another Red unit, the 15,000 strong Steel Division of General Zobla, rushed from the Caucasus front and attacked the Whites in their unguarded rear. The Reds weren't the only ones with amateur armies. The Cossacks were soon pushed back across the Don River. Back to the west, Germany was running out of soldiers. The Schlieflin Plan, the offensive of Verdun, the British blockade, another massive German offensive started on March 21, 1918, which brought the German army to within 37 miles of Paris and allowed the cannon of Crump of Essen's Big Bertha's to rain shells down on the French capital, had bled and weakened the German state. In fact, it took one million German casualties just to get this close to Paris. But now that the Americans were in the war, and other countries were increasing the number of men being sent to France, on September 28, 1918, Deputy Chief of Staff General Heinrich Ludendorff told his superior, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, that the Reich could no longer win the war. There were no reserves of men left. So, a half a million soldiers from the Eastern Front were transferred to the West. But it would make no difference. On November 9th, Lenin screamed to the 6th All-Russian Congress of Soviets, We have never been so near to international proletarian revolution as we are now. And sure enough, Berlin feared the revolution that Lenin was praying for. To calm the anxious German people, the Kaiser, Wilhelm II, abdicated his throne. This signaled the end of Germany's active participation in the war. The armistice was signed on November 11, 1918, in Marshal Foch's railway car in the French forest near the French lines. Hitler would remember this slight against German honor and make the French pay. Right away, the German troops were told to withdraw, except for those in the former Russian Empire. They were to stay put until given instructions by the Entente. Moscow tore up Brest-Liptovsk and refused to pay any more of the six billion indemnity it owed. The Allies made Germany renounce it as well. Yet Russia was in ruins. The Russian Empire lost two million dead. It had another 2.5 million wounded. Another 2.4 million had contracted one disease or another. 3.9 million had been taken prisoner. But it would be going too far to say that Lenin lost sleep over these numbers. He had gambled greatly in 1917, and though his Russia had lost much, the war was over, and he was still standing, and the Kaiser wasn't. Besides, he still had the ongoing, nay, increasing feud between Stalin and Trotsky. This was now his great threat. 
Other Bolsheviks had entered this fray, mostly on Stalin's side. But Trotsky seemed to be able to handle himself, and besides, was still invaluable to Lenin. But so, too, was Stalin in a different way. In the opening of 1919, Lenin sent Stalin to Vyatka in the Urals. The Bolshevik leader wanted to know how the area had fallen to Admiral Alexander Kolchak of the White Army. Kolchak had been the commander of the Baltic Fleet, but that commission was lost with the February Revolution. He would then be sent to America to help organize the Allied invasion of the Dardanelles, but that never came off. When Lenin took power, Kolchak was in Japan on his way back home. So then he joined forces with the British. His job was to topple Lenin and get Russia back into the Great War. Joining with local SRs, or Socialist Revolutionaries, most of them were arrested by Cossacks. The rest made Kolchak their leader with emergency powers. He released a statement that as the provisional government was gone, he was assuming the mantle, and as such, the Bolsheviks were his enemy. The whites of Russia had their leader. By March of 1919, Kolchak had 300,000 kilometers and 700 million people under his rule. It was now that the Bolshevik Central Executive Committee made Kolchak its top priority. Hello everyone, Ray here. How would you like your nightly dinners and the making of those dinners to be fun, delicious, and simplicity itself? You can with HelloFresh. After all, as HelloFresh says, we are on a mission to save home cooking because it's just too good to go away. HelloFresh does all the heavy lifting for you. They shop, plan, and deliver step-by-step recipes and ingredients right to your door in a recyclable insulated box for free. So you can relax and enjoy all there is to love about cooking. Want proof? My two youngest daughters, who are typical kids, actually get excited when a HelloFresh package comes to our door. They jump up and insist upon helping to make dinner. And as most meals only take 30 minutes to make, we find the whole family getting involved and spending time together, talking about our day. Of course, it's mostly of Kiki being nice to someone, and Sophie, not so much. This week we enjoyed, let's see, sesame shrimp, melty Monterey Jack burgers, and quesadillas. Just so you know, HelloFresh currently offers customers a classic box, a veggie box, and a family box. Customers can order three, four, or five different meals per week designed for either two or four people. New recipes are created every week, and it works out to be less than $10 a meal. So you eat well, and you don't break the bank. If I had to sum up the entire HelloFresh experience, it would be delicious ingredients you'll love to eat, simple recipes you'll live to cook. So get cooking. It's so easy, the meals come in individual boxes to organize each meal's ingredients. You just open them up and follow the instructions. Even this podcaster can do that. And what I do end up with is a healthy and satisfying meal that I and my family created. So I want you to give it a try. And for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and enter World War 30. That's World War 30. It's that easy. Just go to HelloFresh.com, enter World War 30, pick your plan, what meals you want, and let Hello Fresh do the rest. When Stalin set out, he again had his wife Nyada with him and her sister. He also took the Cheka's leader with him. Stalin would issue three reports to Lenin, some of them telling the truth, but Stalin never passed up an opportunity to attack an enemy. His first report accurately told of the people's anger towards Bolshevik policy regarding the hoarding of foodstuffs to be sent to the cities, leaving the countryside without adequate food. But then reality left Stalin's writings as he attacked Trotsky's policies and those of Trotsky's allies in the Red Army. Stalin also castigated the former Tsarist officers who had recently joined the Reds. To Stalin, 
they had not been trustworthy earlier, why should they be so now? Meanwhile, in Paris, the crafters of the Versailles Treaty, though according to Francis Marshall Falk, who said, this is not a peace, it is an armistice for 20 years, wasn't sure what to do with Russia. Falk wanted a preemptive war to curb the Bolsheviks. Other French officials wanted containment. Lloyd George believed the Bolsheviks could be moderated through trade, while other Britons wanted a unified Russia to check Germany, whatever her future held. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. But Lenin's Russia would regard Versailles as invalid as Moscow had not been invited. To be sure, representatives from Stalin's Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the Ukraine were accepted, but no one from Lenin's camp. Very well, the communists would hold their own meeting. Invitations were sent out worldwide, but with the Allied blockade, only 34 delegates outside Russia successfully made the journey. Many of those attending were from the countries that recently belonged to Russia. On March 2, 1919, the meeting, which was called the Third Communist International, or Common Turn, got underway. Lenin used the meeting to stick his thumb in Germany's eye. His proclamation denounced bourgeois democracy and upheld the idea of the proletariat dictatorship. This was the very argument the Social Democrats were having in Berlin. Yet, during this meeting, Lenin would receive a personal blow. The Bolshevik Party, a major one, and Stalin would lose a colleague. There would also be one less person in between Stalin and Lenin. Just after the meeting, word came that Zverlov had died. He had succumbed to typhus, but the rumor was that he died after being physically attacked while giving a speech in a Russian factory. Lenin was shocked into immobility. Another meeting was held after this news, which started with a funeral procession for Zverlov. Lenin praised the younger man to the skies for his organizational skills, and this was true. The Bolshevik party had doubled in size from last year. Yet the Whites would spin this meeting as a gathering of kike Bolsheviks, even though only 17% of those that attended were Jewish. Still, it was a slur. Trotsky was not there, as he had traveled back to the former front. The area was still unstable and being attacked by White forces, with Allied help. Lenin had called for a regular army to be organized, that would be controlled directly by the Bolsheviks through its commissars and the Communist Party. Trotsky was not for this, but submitted as it was a practical step forward. Lenin cried out at the meeting to his detractors, So can you give me ten divisional commanders, fifty regimental commanders, two army commanders, and one front commander today, and all of them communists? 
Of course, the answer was no. Stalin then spoke, backing Lenin's position. He reminded the assembly that the other European countries had regular armies, and one can resist only with a strictly disciplined army, as well as a conscientious army with highly developed political departments. Then he went after the Achilles heel of the Red Army, that it was mostly made up of peasants. I must say that the non-worker elements, which constitute a majority of our army, peasants, will not fight for socialism. They will not. Voluntarily, they will not fight. He was coming close to Trotsky's position that a professional trained army was needed if the Bolsheviks were going to defeat the whites and gain the respect and fear of the rest of Europe. Of course, he never said Trotsky's name. That would be giving his enemy too much credit. But then, showing his true colors, Lenin retook the podium and said that when Stalin had shot people in Tsaritsyn, he, at first, thought it was a mistake. Not a crime, just a mistake. But now that he knew the full story, Stalin had not been wrong. They were at war. Strong measures had to be taken. A vote was taken the next day, and Lenin's position of Trotsky and Stalin's idea to grab a firmer control of the Red Army and to make it more professional, won the day, 174 votes to 95. So a five-person commission was created, three from the winning side and two from the losing. Stalin was ordered by Lenin to write to Trotsky to inform him of the good news. The older leader was still trying to bring these two men together. Hello, everyone. Ray here. As some of you know, in two weeks, I will be traveling to Australia for a three-week vacation. Now, in case you didn't know, Australia is really big. I mean, massively so, which means the weather will be all over the place. And as I'm traveling to four different cities, I'll have to keep up with all my stuff. But I will never know when I need what. But not to worry, because I've got two jackets from Scott Evest. The sterling jacket for men, and the packet jacket, which has an adjustable hood. Let's see, I've got them here. The packet jacket is very light. It's made of water and stain repellent fabric, which is perfect for those rainy days, and my kids, who will probably spill something on me, on the plane, who don't have to worry now about Dad telling them to go sit with their mother. I can just wipe it right off. It has a cell phone pocket, two small drop-in pockets, and two large drop-in pockets. All of my electronics will easily fit. No extra bag for me. Then there's the sterling jacket. I just love saying that. This is a wholly different creature. Again, it's a lightweight jacket. It repels water and stains. Again, the kids are safe because they're clumsy. It has 13, I think. I lost count somewhere pockets. Honestly, I've had this thing for two weeks, and I'm still finding pockets and pen holders. Really, I just found the extendable key holder and the large pocket along the back. The hand warmer pockets can easily hold a bottle of water. But as I'm traveling to Australia, a former British colony where they sent their criminals, relax Aussies, I'm just joking, but one of its pockets has the RFID blocking technology. So my credit cards and passports, or rather the chips inside them, are safe from scanning. This jacket I'll be using most of the time, but here's the best part. In Melbourne, where it will be cold, I can look good, carry all my stuff, and stay warm. But when we go up north to Khan, it will be much warmer. No problem. The sleeves are detachable, so now I have a vest that still has all the pockets I need. Honestly... I haven't told the wife yet what's inside this thing. She'll probably make me carry all her stuff, which I could, but this may just stay my little secret. So go check out the jackets, pants, and hoodies for men and women. Oh, maybe I should get her one. This clothing will change your life, and for a limited time, enter promo code HISTORY for an extra 20% off. That's promo code HISTORY for 20% off at Scott the letter evest.com slash history. Scott evest.com slash history. But these were only 
political victories for Lenin. The country was still hungry and cold. During the last meeting, the men stayed bundled up, as there was no coal or wood to heat the place. The left-leaning non-Bolsheviks derided Lenin's party as the socialism of poverty and hunger, that the ever-reduction of available food was being collected by force and sent to the two armies, the one in the field and the other behind all those Bolshevik desks, that this new Russia was producing less grain than the Tsarist Russia of 1916. There were too few farmers, too few trains to take the food to the people, too few mills, as people had abandoned their farms during the war to make their way to the cities. Moscow's population had grown during the Great War to over two million, but now that number was less than one million, and there still wasn't enough food coming in to feed them. Stern measures were needed. After all, grain was still being grown, but some 80% of it was going to the black market. So another new commissariat for state control was created, and the man tasked with running it was Stalin, along with his current position of nationalities commissar. He would be given great powers to oversee state administration centrally and locally. As this was being created, the Congress also formed a new Central Committee, the party's executive body that would be positioned in between the various Congresses. And if you're getting confused by all the Bolsheviks' creations, you're not alone. It requires several read-throughs after a few pages. This new Central Committee had 19 members and 8 candidate members. Trotsky was put on this committee, but just barely. His name was becoming synonymous with creating a professional army, which they all feared, and having Bolsheviks control it, which all the non-Bolsheviks feared. The Congress also created a small political bureau, or Politburo, and a party secretariat. This body would work with the larger organization just created called the Org Bureau. Lenin explained it this way to the wider party. The Org Bureau allocates personnel, while the Politburo decides policy. The Politburo had five voting members. Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Lev Kamenev, Nikolai Krestinsky, and three non-voting members, Zinoviev, Kalinin, and Bukharin. Krestinsky was replacing the deceased Zverdlov. The Great War was over, but now came the inflation. Life savings were now meaningless. This caused Soviet groups to spring up throughout Europe. In reaction to the Soviets, groups of fascists came about, hoping to halt the path towards Leninism. Soon street battles broke out. Men fell from both sides. The various governments were unable to maintain peace, or at least order. As the Russian Civil War grew more intense, it would become clear, though after the fact, that the whites, with their cry of restoring order, were fighting most ineffectively. They went to great pains to gather intelligence, having spies throughout the country, but never used the information collected. As in, one department gathered intelligence, the other ran the war, but the two halves never came together. Another way the whites shot themselves in the foot was by not only ignoring the desires of national minorities, but actively launching hundreds of pogroms against any Jews within their areas of control, in the east, to the south, and northwest. The other European countries, wanting the whites to win and wanting to help them, were forced to back off to a degree because of this cruelty. Lastly, the two major forces of the Whites never came together to act in coordination. The Whites knew that taking Moscow would be the key to victory, most certainly if Lenin and his main lieutenants could also be captured. So in the spring of 1919, Kolchak moved out to the east towards Moscow. But he only got so far. Then General Anton Denikin who had been with the Imperial Army, but now with the Whites, moved out from the south 
and with him were the Cossacks. Yet his advance stalled as well. So, in the early summer, General Nikolai Yudinich, another former imperial officer, drove southeast from the Baltic states towards Petrograd. His attack was no more successful than the other two, yet their very attacks panicked the Bolsheviks. Of course, the Reds had their own shortcomings. Stalin never tired of hounding Trotsky or his adherents, though Trotsky was relatively safe on his famous armored train that required two engines to move it. Stalin did manage to have Jakums Vasetis, the Red Supreme Commander, replaced with his own Sergei Kamenev. Trotsky, who narrowed his entire existence down to just fighting the whites, could not take any of this infighting any longer, so submitted his resignation to the Central Committee on July 5th. Yet they wisely refused to accept it. To add insult to injury, Stalin's man, Voroshilov, had been arrested for concrete failures of his loss of Kharkov, whereas Vasetti's Trotsky's man, was taken in for vague accusations of working with the Whites. But Lenin would step in and save the man, before Stalin could manage to have him shot. The war between Stalin and Trotsky was now beyond repair and open for the world to see. Still, Lenin knew he would need what Stalin brought to the table, a ruthless ability to get the job done, but also that Trotsky was someone the Reds could not do without. Lenin would, time and again, defend Trotsky. He helped the younger man subordinate the military to the party to keep it out of Stalin's hands, as long as he never got control of the party, and was known to have said in regards to Trotsky, Show me another man able to organize almost a model army within a single year and win the respect of the military specialists. One can't help but wonder that if Lenin let Stalin have his way in getting rid of Trotsky that summer of 1919, how the Civil War would have been changed, as would have history. To prove this point further, Trotsky had dashed his way to the south during Denenkin's advance, and listened to Sergei Kamenev propose a counterattack down the Don towards Zaritsyn. If this could be done, then Denikin would be cut off from his base. His advance would be forced to stop. But Trotsky realized this would leave the path to Moscow open, if Denikin could still find a way to advance. Besides, if Trotsky's different path was taken, his train could move his men into place faster and in relative safety. But Stalin believed he had finally found Trotsky making a military mistake, the one thing Trotsky's entire reputation rested on. So he convinced Lenin to give Kamenev his way. Their forces moved out, but Denikin was able to live off the land and so kept moving. Soon Kiev was captured, as was much of the Ukraine. By October, Denikin's forces were just 240 miles, or 386 kilometers, from Moscow. The Politburo realized its mistake, and then backed Trotsky. He was able to move in, rally the local population, and use his large army to harass the whites to a standstill. Stalin realized victory didn't mean much if they all went down together. As stated recently, once Denikin's advance was stopped, Udenich's force of 17,000 started their advance to the south. They were backed by six British tanks, and leaving Estonia, moved towards Petrograd. Lenin right away wanted to abandon the previous capital and send all troops to Moscow to secure it. But then, Admiral Kolchak the White's supreme commander, made the political mistake of refusing to acknowledge Finnish independence, so no help came from the Finns. Stalin and Trotsky had both told Lenin that losing the cradle of the revolution, Petrograd, would be a huge mistake, militarily and for the Bolsheviks' prestige. But this common view did not warm their relationship. Again, Trotsky rushed to this new front 
and managed to stop the whites. More times than Stalin cared for, the younger man had saved the day and saved the revolution. By November 7, 1919, on the second anniversary of the revolution, the three white advances had been stopped, and each time the one name that was praised was Trotsky's. The commander had just turned 40 years old. Trotsky was then told to come to Moscow to receive the Order of the Red Banner from Lenin himself, Soviet Russia's highest state award. But then Kamenev asked that Stalin be given the same award. But why? As Bukhanin said at the time, can't you understand? Stalin can't live unless he has what someone else has. Stalin did receive his award, but separately. When Trotsky was awarded, there was an ovation. When Stalin got his, no one clapped. As Admiral Kolchek retreated, his command fell apart. He was then captured, shot, and his body thrown into a hole, cut into a frozen river. But that did not make up for the fact that the Tsar's gold reserves, through a circuitous route, had ended up with the Admiral, but was soon captured by the Czech Legion. Some 480 tons of ingots and coins stored in 36 freight cars. Trotsky, being Trotsky, had the Red Commander and the Commissar that had lost the gold summarily shot. The gold, what was left of it, ended up in a Shanghai bank. It would not be recovered. What was left of Denikin's force retreated to the south and gathered in the Crimean Peninsula. But by then, they were down to only 30,000 men. Denikin would lose command and flee to Paris. There was a new leader chosen, but the Whites' strength was gone. With the fighting mostly done for the year, Stalin stepped in and wrote to Trotsky that the whole of the officer corps trapped in the Crimea had to be shot. This order was carried out. By the time the guns were silenced, some 30 governors, 50 generals, and more than 300 colonels and as many counterintelligence agents were dead. By now, the Reds had lost about 70,000 men overall. The Whites about double that amount. To be sure, the Reds had not fought intelligently or professionally either. Many mistakes were made by Trotsky, Lenin, and Stalin. Yet the Bolsheviks only had to hold on. It was the Whites who could only define victory as the total destruction of the enemy and the capture of Petrograd and Moscow. As for Stalin's contribution to the now inevitable Red victory, Even Trotsky had to acknowledge that Stalin could exert pressure like no other. The Civil War had brought many bottlenecks of supplies and men, but then Lenin would send Stalin to the area of contention, and soon all was straightened out. Of course, there were always bodies lying on the ground when Stalin left, but that's how he got rid of supposed troublemakers and motivated those he let live. The Russian Civil War was, for all intents and purposes, over. The remnants of the Whites still had to be cleared up, but the foreigners, the Europeans, and the Americans were gone, or soon would be, by the end of 1919. But not the Japanese. They were asked, near the end of 1917, to participate in a 11-country expedition to enter Russia in the Far East, to rescue the Czech Legion and watch over the American war goods stationed there, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. At first, Japan said no, but then in 1918, changed its mind, and the reason for sending troops. Exclaiming their anti-communist motives, the Japanese government sent over more men than asked for, but it was soon apparent why. Eventually, sending over 70,000 troops, Japan sought to recapture land lost to Russia and other European countries on the Asian mainland. When the Americans left Vladivostok in 1920, the Japanese stayed behind. And they were now a link in the chain that locked Bolshevik Russia from spreading any further. Along with Japan was Poland, Romania, and Britain. And their goal was to make sure communism 
did not go any further. It was the next best thing to defeating it outright. As for the international scene, Lenin, but it was true of the Tsars as well, did not recognize the independence of Georgia, Ukraine, or Finland. In fact, to Moscovites, the Ukrainians were little Russians. Yet now, officially, after the Great War, Finland, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia were independent. There was also Armenia and Azerbaijan. They would all have to be brought back into the Russian fold, whether they wanted that or not. Rubbing salt in the wound, the Allies, the victors of the Great War, though they did not recognize Soviet Russia, officially recognized Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. Dealing with these various interrelated issues brought Stalin and Lenin closer together, as the former was the commissar of nationalities. As these two worked their way through wanting the state to be the sole holder of power while giving the people of whatever part of Russia and those that were now independent of it reasons or self-motivations for being productive, the concept of Russian Federation emerged. It was the best they could do, but also the best course to take. Make the various regions acknowledge Moscow as its master, but at the same time retain some independence. Thus they would know that not everything they produced would be confiscated by the party. This would be formalized in 1921 at the 10th Party Congress. Lenin's new economic policy allowed peasants to sell most of what they grew, though the state reserved the right to take the rest. With the threat of the whites mostly removed and the other European countries dealing with their own chaos, it was time for Lenin to turn Marxism into a functioning government. During the coup, the slogan had been peace, bread, land, and national self-determination. But it was that last one that caused the most trouble. Marx had written, The nationality of the worker is neither French, nor English, nor German. It is labor. His government is neither French, nor English, nor German. It is capital. His native air is neither French, nor German, nor English. It is the factory air. So, how do you have a country and government by the people, for the people, but not necessarily of the people? For it must never be forgotten that Lenin and his many lieutenants were sociopaths, unable to really sympathize with others. Lenin's answer early on was a proletariat dictatorship. After all, someone had to run the government, control the army, and deal with foreign powers and a dictatorship would have the strength to cut through the corruption and inefficiencies. But now, as one of the main goals of the Bolsheviks was to reclaim those territories that were now independent, a form of federalism seemed needed. But federalism, having a central government along with semi-independent local governments, bled Lenin of the absolute power he craved. Stalin was against this, as well, at first. But he would soon come around. Leading the charge, Stalin argued and wrote of a Soviet form of federalism. And he would win the day. Hence, Soviet Russia was altered to the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, or FSFSR. But as we now know, this was not the last stage of Russia's evolution. It would change again according to Stalin's wishes. Though Russia was now federated, the party itself was not. It was declared that all decisions of the Russian Communist Party are unconditionally binding on all branches of the party, regardless of their national composition. The Central Committee of the Ukraine, Latvian, Lithuanian Communist Parties enjoy the rights of regional committees of the party, and are wholly subordinated to the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party. For the people, yes, but alas, not of or by the people. Power was not to be shared, and as Stalin rose to the ranks, that idea, that desire, 
would not change.